For former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, protesters calling for an immediate ceasefire in Israel-Palestine just don't know what they're talking about. Let's listen in. People who are calling for a ceasefire now do not understand Hamas. That is not possible. It would be such a gift to Hamas because they would spend whatever time there was a ceasefire in effect rebuilding their uh, armaments, you know, creating stronger positions to be able to fend off uh, an eventual um, assault by the Israelis. So we're in a very different world. I don't think it had to be the world we're in, but that's where we are and we've got to figure our way uh, forward through it. Now, a protester is demanding answers from Senator John Fetterman on why he won't support a ceasefire. This person was kicked out of a fundraising event over the weekend. Let's watch it go down. 10,000 people in Gaza have been killed, half are children. The Pope's calling for a ceasefire. The UN is called for it. I'm just asking you, you're a good guy. I voted for you. I know you're a nice guy. This is important. Here, can I give you a phone? Here. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's been interesting to see Fetterman very full-throatedly um, in, in favor of um, giving Israel uh, whatever it wants uh, from the American taxpayers to continue this war effort, um, despite being, I think, perceived as a more left figure on a lot of economic issues, um, very much not in line with what um, the activist left feels about this issue. I'm not surprised by Hillary Clinton's position. I'm no, slightly that's not surprised. surprising. <laughs> I'm slightly surprised by Federer's position here. Uh, Hillary Clinton was caught on an audio tape back in 2006 talking to press where she said, I don't think we should have pushed for an election in Palestinian territories. She went on to say, if we were going to push for an election, we should have made sure that we did something to determine who was going to win. I think that summarizes how she feels about the Palestinian people. She doesn't even believe they deserve their right to self-governance. She really doesn't believe they de they're deserving of basic human rights. So I don't think anyone should listen to her when she says that people don't know what they're talking about when they're calling for a ceasefire. Does she think the 100 plus countries that just voted for the UN General Assembly, Assembly resolution for a ceasefire, that all of those state departments don't know what they're talking about, that all of those ambassadors are not making a well-informed decision when they go to the floor of the United Nations to represent their countries? This is a, a terrible diplomatic choice on Hillary Clinton's part to say that the United States doesn't believe what any of you all are talking about. And me, as the former Secretary of State, thinks a ceasefire is a bad idea because that would allow Hamas, as she said, to stockpile armament to eventually defend themselves against an Israeli escalation and Israeli attack. That's absurd. She also doesn't believe they have a right to defend themselves. It's just disgusting what's coming out of Hillary Clinton's mouth. Now, Fetterman, uh, had this guy kicked out of his event. This is someone who voted for him, who paid for a ticket to go to the fundraiser, and Fetterman won't even answer a question. And I think it's because he doesn't have an answer at all. And this is someone who's supposed to be a progressive. Yeah, uh, Hillary Clinton has no credibility on this issue or foreign policy issues in general. Her judgment on this subject has been wrong over and over again. She was a famous vocal, one of the chief cheerleaders of the Iraq war on the Democratic side, a war that was totally unnecessary and destabilized the Middle East and actually emboldened terrorism and made the area less safe and negatively impacted U.S. Um, foreign policy, despite all of the blood, sweat, and tears we pour into that effort, an effort that also, also resulted in unfathomable death and destruction, including among innocent people. She was also the chief architect within the Obama administration as when she served as Secretary of State of the Libya intervention that saw the toppling and then horrific murder of uh, Muammar Gaddafi. That did not improve the situation in Libya. In fact, it spawned ISIS, was swiftly able to take over, then we had to wipe them out. So she has a, a long history of just un, unbelievably bad judgment about foreign policy calls. So I, I certainly see why, um, if, if she's getting behind a ceasefire, it would make people say, uh, oh, is that, I, I didn't know Hillary Clinton supported it. It's probably a bad idea then. Uh, yeah, excuse me, opposing a ceasefire, not getting behind it, opposing it. <laughs> Right. I don't think anyone who's out protesting a ceasefire will be swayed by Hillary Clinton saying they don't know what they're talking about. 
I think it's ridiculous to assume that a bunch of people that know they might face arrest and are so willing to go out and get arrested because they believe in their convictions that Hillary Clinton telling them they don't know what they're talking about will make them decide to stay home or change their views. I think that's absurd. But I think what's going on with Fetterman represents something that's happened a lot in the progressive faction of the Democratic Party. And it's where you have candidates like AOC, who, when she was running, didn't mince words words in an interview in 60 Minutes. In 2018, the same year that the Israeli government killed over 31,000 Palestinians, she said that it was an occupation and that the occupation needs to end. Then she decided to vote present when the Congress was voting on whether or not to fund Israel's construction of their Iron Dome. The power that APAC and a lot of big money has uh, in influencing how progressives feel about Israel, how they decide to communicate about Israel, how they decide to vote about the, the U.S. support of Israel, it changes as soon as they get the threat of having a primary challenger of that APAC money. And they have to make this terrible calculation. Do I want to stay in my seat? I've been elected to represent people. I promise to get a lot of things done for the working class and stand on so many issues. Am I going to be able to scrap just this one issue and forego my values and views when it comes to how I feel about the Israeli occupation of Palestine and just do what AIPAC wants me to do so that I can keep my seat and not get millions funneled into a primary opposition? That's an awful consideration for a progressive member of Congress to make, but it's one they have to make all of the time. It's a big reason why Senator Nina Turner lost her race in Ohio, because her opposition was so heavily funded by AIPAC and pro-Israel PACs. It's really time we get money out of politics. And we have a Congress that, instead of having 97.9% of members of the House of Representatives uh, vowing their support to Israel, only nine members not vowing their support to Israel, when we have 41% of Americans saying that they don't want to send weapons to Israel, it's insane. It's not representative of our actual uh, base of the people that are supposed to be represented. And a big reason of that is PAC money being donated in these progressive primary challenger races. Yeah, I mean, there are some Republicans who feel have you know made no uh, secret that they don't want to continue this kind of funding. Thomas Massey voted against um, the uh, the declaration that uh, the speaker, the new speaker, put forth because it affirmed our support for continued aid. A lot of Republicans had broken ranks on Ukraine, and I suspect, and we now we hear Marjorie Taylor Greene said she would vote against aid package. Um, I, I think uh, there are Republicans who understand that a lot of their constituencies, and it's not about the morality of the, for Republicans, I don't think, it's not about the morality of Israel versus Palestine. It's not about um, being against Israel taking out a terrorist group. It's about spending American dollars in America, not being responsible for the national security problems of every other country on the earth, of knowing that we are just creating more problems for ourselves when we, when we intervene and get involved in regional, ethnic, and religious conflicts all over the globe, that that's not what the Ameri what American taxpayers want. They don't want their, their money spent overseas. And they would fe feel safer if um, a lot of our troops abroad were, you know, were not just like sitting ducks in bases in random places. Um, Senator Rand Paul had a bill to withdraw American troops from a base in Niger, um, and that was a, 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 a that attracted the support of both of some Republicans and some Democrats, unfortunately voted down by our, you know, forever war interventionist bipartisan consensus. So that is um, very always a source of frustration that, you know, even if we disagree about how these how I, these conflicts should be resolved or who's at blame or what tactics should be used there, I think there is a lot of agreement that. The, it should not broadly be the U.S.'s business to be more involved, to be caring more, to putting other countries before our own, and that you know that these governments can bear can bear the responsibility themselves. I mean, with the Ukraine example, why if it is such an issue for Europe, why are we the ones that have to fund it? Why isn't Germany stepping up? Why isn't the U.K. stepping up? Why is it always the U.S.? The American people feel like we're suckers. Our government is is a government of suckers, and I think they're fed up with it. But we will see if um, if. If opposition for uh, increased military funding um, picks up any steam among members of either party, frankly. More rising right after this.